So just a few things. That I, why don't you start off by running through what you did um, with the cameras on rockets and what technology you used? All right, sure. Well, <clears throat> I mean, what, the cameras we use are pretty lame compared to the stand the cameras that Steve has. Uh, but we, we do get video. Um, <laughs> so um, we basically just use, uh, currently use uh, television resolution approximately uh, cameras that um, are mounted on the rockets and, and that, that gets um, transmitted down to the ground. Uh, that's really not much more complicated than that. Um, with, with our Dragon spacecraft, when that goes to the space station, it will have a lot more cameras, probably half a dozen or, or more cameras, and those will be digital and will be high def. So that'll be you know, pretty, pretty cool imagery. Yeah. Um, spectacular. Yeah. So. <laughs> and Steve, do you want to tell them a little bit more about just the technology or where it's headed in 20 years from? Oh, it's, uh, I mean, the, the next big thing, as I said, is that, uh, that Mars Science Laboratory mission. Um, you know, what, I, what I'm hoping to see is I'm hoping to see some real communications infrastructure put in place at Mars. What I'd like to do is see a real digital commsat. You know, the problem is every time we send an orbit to Mars, we can't resist the temp te temptation to hang science instruments on it because we want to do science, right? <laughs> and but then, okay, if you got science instruments, you don't want to be way out here where a commsat wants to be. You want to be down close so you can take really good pictures like the ones that I showed you. Problem is, that's a really bad place for a communications orbiter to be. We actually get all of our data, nearly all of our data, relayed through a, a com what we use as a communication satellite. But the way that, you know, the way communication satellites work on Earth, it hangs out there and it hangs in the sky at a geostationary point. You can see it all the time. You point your dish at it, right? The way these, is this what's doing this? No, I don't know. No, you're live on the, you're good. That's your plug. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there we go. Um, the way we get our data down from these rovers is we wait for an orbiter to go, to go overhead. And what that means is if you're the rover opportunity and you're sitting there, you, got all these, you took all these pictures and you want to get them back to Earth because that's your job. And it's 4.30 in the afternoon. And what happens is that orbiter will pop over the horizon, go screaming all across the sky in about eight minutes, and then disappear. And you're not going to see it again for 12 hours. And then it's going to be in the middle of the night when you can't wake up. So it's really 24 hours until you get to spend, send data back again. And that's not an optimal communication strategy. So what I'd like to see is I'd like to see real commsats in orbit around Mars, and then you could be talking about high definition video from the Martian surface. That would be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, that would be very cool. We should talk what? about that. <laughs> <laughs> are, these, are all of the, the camera work, all of the photos that you've actually sent back, those are all part of the public domain? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Everything's public. You know, there's a, there's a really cheap trick that I pull every time I give a public lecture. What I do is I'll give a public lecture about Mars and rovers and so forth. And sometime, somewhere in there towards the end of the lecture, I always put up a picture and say, and this just came down from Mars four hours ago. You know, this is what it looked like on Mars four hours ago. And everybody goes, ooh, you know. I just download it from the public website that anybody else can go to. Uh, we, just, we just pipeline all this stuff straight to the web. So it's the, the raw images go out there absolutely in real time. It takes time, as you might imagine, to put those beautiful color mosaics together and get all the seams out of them and all of that. But as soon as they're done, bang, they're right out there on the web. So what everything we do is there. What resolution? Uh, they, they are all available at the absolute, you know, full resolution delivered by the cameras. And also reduced resolution to make it easier for download as well. Um, yes, we have found a number of things that I would say are uniquely Martian. Um, one thing that you find a lot of on Mars that you just don't find on Earth anymore is uh, what geologists would call crater ejector. There are lots of impact craters on Mars, and when you know, a crater forms, it throws a lot of rock in the air, falls out on the, on the ground, and it makes a distinctive kind of rock that you don't tend to run into much on Earth because there aren't a lot of big impact craters on Earth. Um, I think the most bizarre example that we came up with was that when we landed at the Opportunity site, we found that the rocks there were chock full of these little round things. They're like four or five or six millimeters in diameter, and they're dispersed through the rock like blueberries in a muffin. They're made of hematite, which is a, an iron oxide. It's a mineral that forms in rust. 
And we finally figured out how these things got there, but it just confused the hell out of us when we first saw them because it was like nothing anybody expected. So yeah, there are some kind of bizarre things in the, in the details of the geology on Mars. Big picture, it looks like, you know, Arizona. Yeah. What was your first thought when you saw the, the white that came through? What was yeah. your first thought? Oh, that yeah, this is, uh, the, the, this is the story he's talking about. The right front wheel on the Spirit rover no longer turns. And you know, it's got six wheels, one wheel is dead. We designed these rovers to last for 90 days, and it's you know, 1,700 days. After about 800, the wheel failed. And so now we drive backwards and we drag that dead wheel through the dirt as we go. Uh, that was part of what made it so hard for Spirit to get out of that sand trap that it was in. And the silver lining to that problem is that it digs this wonderful hundreds of meters long trench through the Martian soil. And every now and then something wonderful will pop up in the trench. And there was one day when we were driving, we were driving in this little valley, and um, the, the, the soil in the bottom of the trench popped up as white as bright snow. Now we'd seen stuff that looked sort of like that before, and it was iron sulfate salts. So that was what I was sure it was. We went over and measured the composition. We've got all these other scientific instruments that'll tell us what things are made of. And this stuff was more than 90% pure silica. Okay, it's not, this is not quartz, it's not beach sand, this is opal. This is the stuff that forms in hot springs. So we, were, we found the remains just through sheer luck because we were dragging our, our dead wheel through this valley of these, these wonderful silica deposits that tell us that there was a hot spring here on Mars. So of course we named the valley, what? No, Silica Valley. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the, the cameras actually are, are quite robust cameras. There's an extreme amount of vibration and acoustics, and um, so, uh, and, and then the cameras are in a sort of a special compartment as well to protect them against um, ascent heating. So, they're in like a box. <laughs> That's the, the, te the technical high temperature term. glass. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I think we'll have like more cool camera stuff to talk about when we, we get our Dragon spacecraft flying. The new probe that you have coming, how deep will that dig? Um, it, the, neither one of these things really is designed to dig. Uh, we, we were able, with our wheels, to work out ways to dig trenches that were eight or nine inches deep, something like that. Um, what this new vehicle does is it, it, it doesn't dig into soil, it drills into rock. And it's got kind of a jackhammer, basically. It's a rotary percussive drill, and it can drill, low oh, like six inches into a rock. Takes a lot of power. Yeah, power is one of the real tough things to come up with in space. It's 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 a it's a hard hard problem. It's especially hard on Mars because it's far from the sun and it's very dusty. So are you using any of his solar panels? No. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're using uh, triple junction gallium yeah, oxide. Yeah, very cherry picked individual. Yeah. You know, highest efficiency we could possibly get. Just just like the most expensive. Your tax dollars are worth. <laughs> thank you. Uh, but the most expensive solar cells money can buy. Yeah, best you can get. Oh gosh, yeah. Oh. And those pictures everything looks so calm. No, 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 no. I, 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 I wish I had more time to show you a whole bunch more, more pictures of Mars. Uh, it's cold in the daytime and really cold at night. <laughs> um, it's so it's in, in the daytime. It's about zero degrees centigrade, so about 32 Fahrenheit uh, uh, winter day, and this is near the equator in the summer. Um, and then uh, at night it goes down to minus 100 centigrade, so it's it's terribly terribly cold. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, um, yes, things freeze. Um, it's very very dry. There's no water vapor to speak of. There's certainly no moisture of any kind. And then there's the dust. Now I guarantee you that when the first astronauts come back from Mars and people say, well, what was it like? one of the first things out of their mouths is going to be, I hated the damn dust. <laughs> um, when you think about Martian dust, don't think uh, sandstorms. Think cigarette smoke. This stuff is incredibly fine-grained, and it just coats everything. Um, and there are dust storms. You asked about the weather. Um, we will see little dust devils, little Martian mini tornadoes that kind of go whirling across the scene. We have actually managed to figure out how to take sort of quasi-videos of those. I've got some on my laptop if anyone wants to see them later, but they're very cool. No, because the atmosphere is very thin. 
There's a lot of things I lose sleep over, but the wind blowing the rover over is not one of them because the atmosphere is less than 1% of the density of the Earth's atmosphere. So that's not a problem. The big problem is dust storms. And you know, the little dust devils, they're fine. Um, but every now and then, Mars will have a truly global dust storm. They tend to happen during the summer in the southern hemisphere. Didn't happen our first summer on Mars. Didn't happen our second summer on Mars. Our third summer on Mars, it did happen. And it blew up into a global dust storm. Just You couldn't see the surface of the planet from orbit. Uh, from where we were, you literally couldn't see where the sun was in the sky. And these are solar power vehicles. So they very nearly died in that dust storm. And it, it was, it's, yeah, the, the weather on Mars is, it's, it's all about dust. And it's horrible. Well, the way we, the, the simple way that we've dealt with the cameras, and it, this has worked remarkably well, is we just, uh, we just point them down. <laughs> we don't have any special covers, lens caps that we put, put on and off because you, you could get stuck on and you don't want that to happen. So we just, whenever we're not using them, we just point them down at the ground. And that has, has worked remarkably well in terms of keeping them clean of the dust. We had no idea when we launched this thing whether or not that was going to work. Uh, but it's actually worked, uh, it's actually worked quite well. Oh yeah, windshield wipers. Okay, every 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 everybody you know everybody's an engineer. Here's the answer to that one. No, no, that's a, that's actually a, it's actually a very good suggestion. It was one of things, several things we looked at. We looked at windshield wipers to clean. This is to clean off the solar arrays. That's the big deal. We looked at windshield wipers. We looked at compressed compressed gas jets. My favorite one was transparent plastic on rollers. No, seriously. And then they get dirty, and you turn the rollers, and fresh, clean plastic comes in, and you know, sun shines through it again. Just um, the well, that's another one. Okay, there's a whole there are a whole bunch of things that you can imagine trying. I'll get to why that doesn't work in a moment. Um, the windshield wiper. Okay, the windshield wiper weighs more than my instrument arm and all of the instruments on it. And we were right up against the stops on how much weight those rockets could uh, could. You know, it's, it's the, the problem that Elon was talking about. The cost of getting mass off of the surface of Earth is so high that it limits what you can do. And our rovers only weigh about 350 pounds a piece. Okay, and that was on top of a Delta II launch vehicle, which fully, I mean, what, what's a Delta II when it's when it fuel? Uh, what's it weigh? Well, it depends on which Delta II you're talking about. But it's typically this about is a heavy. This about is five, the heavy. Oh, it, Delta, 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 five or 600,000 pounds? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Um, How much is it per ounce? Uh, well, Delta II isn't flying any, I mean, they're, they're, they're not selling Delta IIs anymore. Yeah. Uh, but if, if you were to buy, say, um, a Delta IV, which is a Boeing developed vehicle, um, the, the fully considered cost of that is about 120 to 140 million dollars. Yeah. At the time, at the time um, we bought our rockets, they were 65 million bucks a piece. That's for Delta II. Yeah, yeah. that was that was that was those rockets. Um, where was I going with that? Windshield wipers. Windshield wipers. Oh yeah. So anyway, in the end, we just chose the brute force approach of making the solar panels as big as we could make them. Um, when we first landed, those, those solar arrays put out so much power, we actually had to shut the rover down for about an hour and a half every afternoon to keep it from overheating because there was so much power being produced. Um, you asked about why couldn't you just take the, the solar arrays and, and move them or something. Rotate them or whatever. Yeah, how we, cells yeah the, the, uh, the problem is, again, that requires lots of motors and actuators, and it's just you know, mm -hmm. too, much, too much work, too much mass. So uh, yeah, sometimes, the, sometimes, very actually surprisingly often, in space, the simple brute force solution is, is the right one to choose. You know, I wish I could tell you that our rovers were these incredibly high technology machines. The computer that's at the heart of our rover was a smoking hot machine in about 1987. <laughs> okay, your cell phones are smarter than my rovers, but my rovers are on Mars, so. Uh, <laughs> But, but, but we tend to use, at least in the deep space spacecraft, we tend to use very tried and true technology because you can't go out there with a screwdriver and fix it. How, how is the airbag, you know, the airbag landing, is that still considered to be a viable way to land a craft? It, it, it depends on how heavy your craft is. Um, for our rovers, the airbags worked. This next one, this next big rover, airbags will not work. It's just too massive, and so there, it's got a different landing system to get it down on the surface. Oh, the, the whole landing site selection process is a real interesting one. Um, you don't know exactly where the thing's going to go. It's going to land somewhere in an elliptical region that's maybe 60 miles long or something, and you don't know where it's going to come down. I mean, just hitting that 
I mean, it's, it's 300 million miles trip from Earth to Mars. It's like sending a basketball from Los Angeles to New York, and it goes through without hitting the rim. I mean, that's how, that's how good the shot is to hit an ellipse that big. But still, so you're going to land somewhere in there. What that means is the whole landing site has to be safe over that big area that's 60 miles long. Um, and so the first, the first criterion is safety. It's got to be uh, hell of it. Um, it's got to be smooth, it's got to be flat, it's got to be you know, a place where you can safely touch the vehicle down on the surface. After that, it comes down to the science. And what are the places that are going to offer the, that are going to offer the best science on the surface? <laughs> You'd be surprised. What's in the back? Wait a minute. So you said it's 300 million miles, so that's about a 30 minute time delay. How do you control something with a joystick with a 30 minute time delay? Ah, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, what I wish I had was that joystick, right? Uh, but in fact, there's this, there's this one way, the one way light time, the distance, the, the, that 300 million miles, that's actually a curving trajectory. But the, the time that it takes the radio signal to go from Earth to Mars is anywhere from three and a half to about 20 minutes. And so, you know, if it's 20 minutes this way, 20 minutes back, 40 minute round trip, you can't joystick it. So what we've had to do is instead endow the vehicles not only with vision, but with intelligence and the ability to make their own decisions about what's safe and what is not. Those color cameras, those are two of actually nine cameras on each vehicle. There are a bunch more cameras I didn't talk about. Some of the most important cameras are little fisheye cameras on the front bump bumper and the back bumper that we use to take images for a number of reasons. And one of them is the rover, as it's driving, can build up a three-dimensional image, a three-dimensional picture in its own mind, in its computer, of the terrain in front of it, and make its own decisions about you know, what it can safely go over and what it has to go around. And we can actually program different levels of courage or cowardice <laughs> into the vehicle, depending on how dangerous that we think the terrain is. So it's, it's got, it's got the, most of the rover is very low tech, actually, but the, the artificial intelligence software, if you will, on board the vehicle is actually pretty state of the art. Yeah. Whose idea was it to start the Twitter account and have it increase traffic and excitement around the rover? Uh, the, the Twitter account that was done, I think you're probably referring to the one for the Mars Phoenix lander. Uh, that, was, that was the brainchild of one very dedicated uh, person named Veronica McGregor <laughs> at, uh, at JPL. And she was the one who put out all of those Twitter updates. She's doing it now for the rovers. God bless her. Um, I was in her office the other day, and she said, my kids hate Twitter. Because she's got, she's got some, some fairly young kids, and, and you know, mom's home in the evening, and she's doing the Twitter stuff. So, um, But yeah, it's Veronica McGregor at JPL. I think she's done a great job. Do you find that this excited, uh, brought more traffic to the website, this excitement overall about Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, any, you know, there's so many media that, we can, that you can use to reach the audience these days. And it makes sense to, to get creative and use as many as you can. This is, this is actually a subject that I personally take really, really seriously. Um, it cost $800 million to get our rovers to Mars. And I don't allow myself to fall back on the convenient sounding, oh, that's a you know, half a pizza for every American kind of argument. You can do a lot of good in the world for $800 million. And so I feel very strongly that for these missions, we have, those of us who get to do them, have a real responsibility to share the results of the missions with the people who paid for them in, in ways that are, that are easy to access and understand. Um, you know, NASA does a lot of fascinating things in space. Okay, they do gamma ray spectroscopy and cosmology. Try explaining gamma ray spectroscopy to an eight-year-old. Okay, it's hard to do. But these are, these are robots. They're looking at rocks. It's not that complicated. <laughs> and you know, I go and I talk to second graders, and they get it. They get it immediately. And uh, especially because it's so important for the future competitiveness of the United States to have young people at a time in their lives when they're making choices about what they want to do when they grow up, have them get exposed to engineering, science, technology, careers. No, they're not all going to grow up and build robots for NASA, but they're going to go off and do interesting things. And so, because, particularly because our mission is so accessible, so easy to understand, we feel a very deep responsibility to convey our story through whatever media we can find. Cinema, the web, Twitter, television, you name it. 
um, to the people who paid for it so that it can be something that will inspire the next generation of explorers to do something way better than we've been able to do. All right, one, one last question, and then we'll, let's wrap it up, yeah. Go ahead. Is there somewhere to watch the uh, video of the, uh, one of your video, more video like that, and is there plans of what you're gonna do with all that video? And given uh, what he said about sharing it with kids. Um, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> it's, it's all, all the video is available on the SpaceX website, so it's just um, S, spacex.com. Um, so you, put, you can get all, all the stuff that I showed. You guys all should go to the SpaceX website if you haven't already. Yeah. Send it on the invite, but it's pretty exciting stuff. It's very and they cool have all stuff. the videos posted there. And, and then I'm assuming like the upcoming launches you can continue to Yeah, we, we do a live webcast of the launches. I can tell you it's the most unbelievable thing. At this, so. you know, our staff at the office was watching that one I was referencing earlier. And you're literally watching, you know, Elon's rockets launch into space live. And you're, you know, you're seeing the Earth get smaller and smaller as they go up into space. And it just, it totally changes, you know, your life. I mean, it really does. It's, it's, <laughs> it's there's nothing like watching it live. I, and the fact that he it was able to put it as a live web stream was even more mind blowing. You know, it's not on TV. You're actually watching it on the web, and you can hear the countdown. You know, and all of that stuff. It's incredibly exciting. We're all drinking scotches. You know, <laughs> <laughs> congratulating. You know, mankind. On <laughs> and this is your chance tonight to congratulate the guy that is actually doing it, which is unbelievable. You know. So let's end it there. And then, you know, you, you said you have a few videos. If people want to come up and see some of these things, um, you know, try and tread light on these guys. He just flew in from Michigan uh, in the snow, and Elon's obviously triple booked uh, every day of the year. Um, so take, you know, but take a moment. You know, both of these guys are so freaking unbelievable. And uh, Elon is taking on so many challenges, frankly, for all of us. I mean, all of us know with Tesla and SpaceX and everything, the challenges, you know, you face every day. We just like we all like think so highly of you and okay. want you to keep going and everybody should you know go up to him tonight introduce yourself and give him a warm hug, <laughs> hug her, <laughs> <laughs> shake his hand because this is your opportunity. <laughs> so hopefully if these guys start working together we all can go up into space by the end of the century. So there's food and drink in the back. And I just want to also thank the volunteers who helped out tonight to give them your thanks if you see them. Oh, yeah, I got this. Yeah, yeah, I got all that. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I mean, I want to try eat and, you know, the party's still going. The party's just getting going. Yeah. All right. Well, I love this here. I think there's news there. Yeah, there is. I know, I know. That's right.